Hey, everyone. To all the men I've tolerated it before is taking a little bit of a summer vacay. So for the weeks of July and August, we will be posting on our main feed our recordings of our Still Comfy episodes featuring Jules Washington. Remember, Still Comfy is our spinoff series where Jules and I get live on YouTube several Mondays of the month to discuss our favorite comfort movies and whether or not they still hold up with our modern lens and viewpoints. And every Tuesday on Instagram Live, we cover some television shows like Mad Men, One Tree Hill, and A League of Their Own, the Prime Amazon series. So make sure that you're following us on all social media platforms, Men I've Tolerated Pod and Natalie K124 on Instagram, Natalie K124 on TikTok. Consider joining our Patreon to get the bonus episodes that you've been missing with our friends and our beloved guests. And have a great rest of your summer. I'll see you in September. There it went. <laughs> Hello, here we are live. Welcome, everybody. Um, this is Still Comfy with Jules and Nat. I'm Julia Washington, the host of Pop Culture Makes Me Jealous, where we analyze pop culture through the lens of race or gender, and sometimes both. And my co-host is... I'm Natalie Katona, the host of To All the Men I've Tolerated Before, your weekly look at everyday misogyny. And tonight we are covering Clueless. And for those of you who are familiar with my show, Pop Culture Makes You Jealous, we covered Clueless in season three. So I'm always happy to revisit. But before we um, dive in, we're going to do a quick waving and hello oh, hi. to our friends hello. to our friends on Instagram to tell them to get their booties over to YouTube to watch us live. Okay, there we go. Right, we did it. <laughs> We did, we did it. it. We can't hear your side of it, but we can hear mine. If anyone um, asks, I'll just make up shit. I love it. I love it. Okay, so Natalie, I'm going to do a quick summary of our film for this evening. You ready? I don't have a song for Clueless because every time I think of Clueless, I think of that Perfect Day song, but that is legally Im- legally blonde in oh, fact. I don't care what my teacher says. I don't know that song. I'm going to be a supermodel. Model. That's the clue song I think of. Okay, you ready? Mm-hmm. Beverly Hills socialite Cher is the most popular girl in school. Discontent by her debate grade, Cher coaxes her teacher, Mr. Hall, into dating English teacher, Miss Geist, hoping to melt. I wrote her, but it's his. Cold, cold heart. <laughs> Inspired by her success, Cher decides to give new girl in town Ty a makeover. When Ty becomes more popular than Cher, Cher realizes her former stepbrother, Josh, was right about how misguided she was. And when Ty sets her eyes on Josh, Cher realizes she's in love with him too. So let's just start... <laughs> Kissing siblings, everybody. That's what we're doing tonight on YouTube. Mm, Kissing mm -hmm. siblings. Yeah. I mean, it's Paul Rudd. But this movie was written and directed by Amy Heckerling. It came out in 1995. It stars Alicia Silverstone, Paul Rudd, Brittany Murphy, R.I.P., Stacey Dash, Donald Faison. So my first question, the question of the night, how old were you when you first started? When you first saw Clueless. I was definitely watching Clueless on TV. Okay. But I was also watching Clueless often. And I think, I can't remember if I watched the scripted television series or the movie first. Because for me, they're intertwined. Oh, that's interesting. I remember being so irritated that they made a scripted television series. Because I thought the movie was perfect. And I was like... How how are you going to do this? Yes, the woman they hired looks just like Alicia Silverstone. Good job there. But no. 
And then in hindsight, now I'm just like, I don't think it fucking matters. Who cares? <laughs> It was so good. It was so charming. Yeah, exactly. Friends, also, if you're tuning in because we are using a third party app to stream, we can't actually know. We don't know that you're here. So be sure to give us a comment. If you're watching the playback, you can still comment in live time. We'll still respond to you because that's what we do. <laughs> um. Yeah, I don't remember how old I was. Um. It definitely wasn't a movie I saw in theaters. So it was definitely a movie I watched on television syndicated. Yeah. yeah, I didn't see it in theaters. 1995, I was 11. My parents had a hard, fast rule of no PG-13 movies until you were 13. So I saw it as like a contraband situation when my mm -hmm. friend rented it for her birthday party the year we all turned 12. Oh. So I'm sneaky, sneaky now. Yeah, I don't really have, like, a, you know, I watched a lot of movies just, like, behind the scenes of my own life on the very small television that they put in my bedroom when I stopped sleeping. Mm. So it wasn't a lot of, like, oh, a monumental affair. Like, I've had way more connections to other movies. I just really like Clueless. I love I, Paul Rudd. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think I was much, much older when I realized it was an adaptation of Emma by Jane Austen. Mm -hmm. And one of the things my guest from the um, Clueless episode pointed out was when you have a female writer, and we've taught when we've mentioned this quite a bit since she's been on the show, and I bring it up quite often. When you have a female writer who also, and then also a female director, the interpretation of the female characters sort of stays true to the integrity of the way they were written. Mm -hmm. But then if you were to swap that out with like a male director, it gets filtered in a way that just doesn't feel authentic sometimes because of the male gaze. Correct. <laughs> And what I love about Amy Heckerling is she also did Fast Times at Ridgemont High. I do like me some Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Mm -hmm. uh, so go ahead. For it, so it's an adaptation of Jane Austen's Emma. Mm -hmm. And for as much as Clueless gets a, oh, this movie is so silly and Cher is so frivolous and all of it, like maybe Clueless is why. I'm a genius because the language that I was hearing from it was so elevated. And now I'm kind of interested to see if it was that elevated in the scripted series. That's a good question. I don't know if the scripted series is streaming anywhere, but I do remember a lot of the stuff that we saw in the nineties and early two thousands that was geared towards teens. Tweens wasn't a thing yet, but just, you know, the younger demographic didn't necessarily speak like the younger, younger demographic. It was more like this is a model of what you should be speaking like. Well, and I or like the words you should be using because I remember like thinking when I remember watching this movie and thinking like, yeah, they're they come off ditzy, but they're actually really smart. Like they, you know, she's an air, she's quote an airhead, but she, there's a lot of depth to her. Um, but then also too, when you think about shows like Dawson's Creek or Gilmore Girls or even One Tree Hill, it's like they're not doing that. The way that they're speaking with each other isn't like. I would argue that it's purposeful in all of those TV shows and plays an integral role to the plot. So like Dawson, real mm -hmm. pretentious, and therefore mm -hmm. Joey, his best friend, also has to be pretentious to keep up with them. All Rory does is read. So she's yeah. not going to talk like your normal teenager. All Lucas Scott does is read and quote dead white men. So he also. <laughs> but Rory's best friend Lane can keep up with her who isn't mm -hmm. necessarily as avid of a reader. She's more of the music indie alt girl type of situation. And I would even argue that it's purposeful and clueless. I think it's part of the satire mm -hmm. that it's like, oh, because it's so much different from girls just want to have fun. Right. in that way where right. girls just want to have fun taught us valley girl like lingo mm -hmm. you would almost think that that would like cross over into clueless and instead they were like no we're gonna write it almost austian or shakespearean mm -hmm. and speaking of the valley girl stuff the way that they have such disdain for going to the valley it really draws that line of like we are 
Beverly Hills. We only go to the Valley sometimes. Like, that's gross. <laughs> so it's setting up its own little, like, division when it comes to being in Southern California. Um, What do you think about Cher and Dion's relationship? I love Cher and Dion's friendship. I think... I think it's very apparent that they have a deep understanding of one another, like you would expect two best friends in high school who have been friends a long time to have. Dion isn't ever really like pushing Cher out to bring Murray in. Um, And then there's even, they keep one another in check, but they also back one another up. Mm -hmm. So Dion pushed a little bit when Cher just wanted to bring Ty in and she's like our social currency. Mm -hmm. And then when Cher was like, that's a shitty thing to say, she was like, okay, (laughs) it's a shitty thing to say. And I guess call that girl over. (laughs) And I also appreciate how they like that scene when, Cher's like, would you call me selfish? And she's like, not to your face. Right. Yeah. <laughs> There's still honesty there. There's still, you know, a level of like, well, you ask me a direct question. I'm going to give you the honest answer. Yeah. Which I love. I feel like it shows that you can really have that relationship and it still be honest. But then also like Dion just admitted like, yeah, I would totally not say that to your face. But since you just asked, you know what I mean? So it's yeah. like there's this level of like. You asked me a question. I'm going to be honest about it. But would Dion also call herself selfish? Probably. Yeah. And I love the dichotomy with Amber and how Amber sort of creates this sort of, they're all in the upper crust, but Amber's still not quite good enough. Yeah. Amber is like the unsinkable Molly Brown without the class in Clueless. Mm -hmm. And and I feel like in the show, they almost address how, like, Amber gets to stick around because... It's, it's the same actress, right? Yeah, who it's was the same. Amber? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, go ahead. So, Stacey Dash, the actress who plays Amber, Murray, and then Sean, his friend who is kind of in the movie, but they make him a bigger deal in the show, Yeah, are all their same actors and actresses. And then, clearly, Paul Rudd and Alicia Silverstone weren't sticking around, so they were replaced. And then Mel also went through a couple replacements. Um, But I think the thing with Amber is that she's so desperate to, she's that obnoxious person in your class who craves your love so much that she's going to be batshit annoying the entire time about it. Hey, Ambular, was that you going through my donation pie or whatever the line is yeah. and she's like whatever like i would be caught dead below melrose <laughs> yeah and it's that all the time and it's and- the exact same dress like the fact that she's just like you cannot call me out i will completely sidestep the fact that you are actually correct and then there there's like this otherworldly awareness that because amber is always around and because amber is a part of their circle should one should Elton get weird with her one night at a party? Cher's taking her home, and so is Dion. Like mm-hmm. she's still very much part of the group. She's just your obnoxious friend who chooses to hate you before you can hate her. Yeah, friend of me before we had the definition or the term. <sighs> Elton, oh my god! I uh, so what Jeremy Sisto got shit. way hotter as he aged. Oh yeah. Yeah, uh, which I didn't realize, but I was a big fan of suburbia. I I forgot how much of a slow burn. it. It's almost the Gaston effect where under the wrong narrator and the wrong person talking to you, Gaston almost comes out as like an okay guy too because he's like, what's wrong? He just had a crush. Yeah. He was just pursuing her. Yeah. He was reading her signals or whatever. And then he pulls the leaving her in the valley for her to get mugged. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and the thing is, is, you know, his the way he presents his like his cues that she should have picked it up. It still to me felt like, no, you're still an idiot because like you took it like I'm not going to pick up that you taking the picture that I took of some other pretty girl as you being interested in me. That's like that's a far reach. Well, 
The thing that got me was that from the very beginning, Elton was already acting like her boyfriend. So mm. I was like, oh, why haven't I ever noticed that before? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because sometimes guys just wake up and decide that they're your boyfriend. That's, yeah, that's hard and unfortunate. Um, And then... <laughs> But, okay, so about that getting mug scene, I do kind of hate this whole situation where a girl is, like, has to leave and, like, remove herself from a situation in order to, like, avoid being assaulted. But then she's mad because he's left. But also at the same time, it's like, Cher, he's a child. Like, getting out of the car, he's going to leave you alone and then he's going to leave you there. I do kind of wish there was, like, she hadn't said, but hey, where are you going? I wish that that had been framed a little differently because I feel like we expect Elton to leave. I still think that no matter the circumstances, I maybe expect a circle round, mm -hmm. like a pretend. I believe I've pretended to drive off on a male friend of mine and told my car, drive the car. And he was like, well, he's still in the." And I was like, yeah, no petty today um but you stop and you pick up your friend and you're not leaving your friend out alone at midnight and like that's the thing too elton isn't just some guy that hangs out and flirts with Cher. he is also ingrained in his friend group so my whole thing is like how are you going to explain it to your entire friend group that Cher got mugged on your watch <laughs> well they never bring it up again they never bring it up again and that's so Elton got a good edit, as Love is Blind would call it, and Cher never, like, freaking sold him out. Yeah, we needed Elton to leave, so that way it opened up the opportunity for her to call Josh and be rescued by Josh. Oh, yeah, it's a great plot device. I just think it's it's not something that you would expect out of someone who has been ingrained in your friend group. I've had male friends come and pick me up. Because friends have left me at the bar and I didn't know until I was like, where are my friends? See, and oh, they I, have left. <laughs> see, that's the thing. I'm the one who's like, if I've kicked you out of my car, do not expect me. I am not rescuing you because you did something egregious that I don't want you here. So you figure it out. But Elton didn't kick her out of the car. She got out of the car. It was her choice. <laughs> right. So, so, yeah, so then his, like, that's on him. He needed to stay. He what show stay. did we just see this on? It was some ridiculous couple. They're driving on a bridge. One Tree Hill? Oh, no, it's the Whitney Houston movie. It's oh, okay. On the Whitney Houston movie, Bobby Brown proposes, and then it immediately becomes apparent that he was also dating someone else while he was dating Whitney. <sighs> so he's proposed, and then the cheating happens, and she gets out of the limo, and they're literally walking up and down this very busy bridge. But Bobby's like literally just waiting her out. And so if Bobby Brown can do it, I just feel and like Elton, Elton could have done do it, it too. too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The difference here, though, is that Elton is a overprivileged white man who's probably been told his entire life he is a sweet baby angel and deserves whatever he wants. So he pitches a fit when he doesn't get it. Yeah. He's Shane. I'm sure that Shane from Love is Blind <laughs> has loved Natalie. And probably Chloe on the side of the road somewhere. Probably. So it's a like, that's the biggest red flag to the friendship then, where it's like, bruh, you left me at this convenience store. Well, you do see him sort of fall back into the background after that point, too. We don't see him as often. Like, he's really heavy in the beginning, especially as Cher's trying to coordinate him, you know, um, match make him with tie but then after that scene he really does fall back into the background and we don't see him as often mm -hmm. he's not as a part of the group he's not as important to the plot devices from that <laughs> then on forward also true last year i did read reread emma to try to because i wanted to do like a comparison or whatever but then i ended up downloading like um an audio uh like a teleplay like an audio play version rather than like some British person reading me mm -hmm. the book. Um, and it was actually really interesting because a lot of it is so very similar, but the things, and now I'm trying to remember what was legitimately changed, but I think Elton ends up marrying somebody else. Like he had, he had been engaged the entire time that he was like in flirting with Emma or whatever, not Emma, the friend, 
who Ty is supposed to be. I should have written all these things down. I should have pulled up my notes from when I did Clueless. <laughs> but then it like it also makes sense being in high school and being the type of guy that Elton is that Elton would just circle right back through the friend group and be like, well, if it's not going to be Cher, it'll be Amber. Yeah. And that couple makes sense to me because mm-hmm. they're both sort of like, he's the guy who he, and he does. He literally says, do you know who my father is? Like that's his personality. Yeah. And, and Amber's the type of gal who's like, yes, I do. And I'm loving it. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Okay, do we want to talk about Ty or do we want to talk about Josh and Cher first? I feel like we should talk about Ty first. Okay. Brittany Brittany Murphy, RIP. Rest in peace, Brittany Murphy. I miss you to this day. I just love her. I need to watch Uptown Girls again. It's been a minute. Uptown Girls. Yeah, that was a good one. Little baby Dakota fanning. Yeah. Okay, so when we first meet Ty, she's clearly from, I don't know, the East Coast maybe. And she's, you know, what what Beverly Hills would deem rough around the edges. Mm -hmm. She's got this terrible dye job on her hair and her clothes are very mid-90s, reminiscent of that like grunge aftermath of like the early 90s or whatever. And Cher is just so excited by the prospect of like making her over and helping her become, you know, something incredible. And Ty is like to kind prove, of to so, prove to Josh that she's charitable. Yes, to prove to Josh that she is charitable. And Ty, and you know, Ty is into it kind of because she wants, you know, she's new. She doesn't know. She wants new friends, what have you. But it's very clear from the beginning that she and Travis Birkenstock have a connection. And Cher is like, absolutely not. He's yeah. so cute. He's so cute, Breck and Meyer. And he's so he's so kind. And just a he, good heart. Just a good heart. Even though even though he probably was well aware that Ty stopped giving him the time of day because of Cher and Dion, mm-hmm. when he was excited about something, he immediately told Cher, immediately yeah. told her that she was welcome. Like, he's just one of those guys where it's like, well, you're not harsh in my vibe. Yeah. Yeah. And I just really appreciate how he doesn't seem to care about the social structure of the school. Mm -hmm. If he likes you, that's it. And I love his speech about when he gets the most tardies. Yeah. (laughs) I'd like to thank McDonald's and their Egg McMuffins for for without which I would never be tardy. Same. Breckenmeyer. Same. Anyway, but as she's going through her her whole transformation with Ty, you know, she's really trying to make her out to be a person just like Cher and maybe a little bit like Dion, clean and appropriate enough to be a part of this social group. No smoking, only do drugs at parties, you know, other harder drugs, not okay kind of situation. And Cher really is more of an innocent in the group than the rest of the characters in the group. She's a virgin who can't drive. So, yeah, it's true. It's literally true. I will say this for the virgin jokes and um, Ty mentioning right away that she isn't a virgin or whatever. For me, it was never tacky because Cher was so comfortable in being a virgin and never dating a high school guy. And Ty was very comfortable and Dion was very comfortable. And it wasn't like a... You, I can't believe that you've had oral sex with uh, Murray. It was always like, well, you know, Dion could honestly go all the way and we wouldn't care. Yeah. And that's part of the reason why I think a lot of reflective articles talk about how really empowering this movie can be is is not can be but is because there is that comfort there right all three of them are in different places in their sexual experiences and all three there's light teasing but it's still like no one's like pressuring the other into doing something or like making the other feel bad because they're only at a certain point where in other movies and tv shows geared towards teens you're led to believe that you will walk into high school and that is the only thing your friends will want to talk to you about right right and even just with all the whole 
it's not that they back down, but when Cher is like, hey, you see, she literally says, you see how picky this sh- I am about the shoes and they only go on my feet. And her friends were like, valid. Yeah. Point. We hear you. We'll drop it. And just that level of respect between all of them. It's so great to see because, you know, now, well, I don't know about now. I don't watch teeny, sh- teeny popper shit now, but it just feels like there's this respectability within the group that creates that harmony um and it really contributed for me the whole myth that your friends will like this is the way that the friend group should always be Mm -hmm. well maybe it shouldn't be a myth maybe it should be reality but sometimes it's hard for me it's like sex positivity with like sex reality whereas other writers male writers Mm -hmm. will write sex positivity as we're all naked and having orgies and swapping partners and having a weird threesome on um gossip girl that gets like hillary duff kicked off the show like (laughs) yeah and that makes a big difference too because you know not everyone if we're going to talk about what representation looks like outside of just um ethnicity and race you know not everyone is comfortable in certain parts of you know With sexuality in any form, it can take years for people, especially if they grow up in a very specific way. And having grown up in a house that was very conservative and, you know, there was purity rings being sold in the auditoriums at churches, it was, to me, that was like, hey, you don't have to be ready to do anything, but no, like, this is okay. Like it's whatever fear- the whatever wherever you are in the spectrum of your sexual experience, it's totally fine as long it's, as you're safe. <laughs> it very much backs up the whole like virginity and all of it is a myth and a construct mm-hmm. because these people chose to live without it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Open the door in that way. The other thing I really think is interesting about Ty's transformation is how she becomes sort of like a worse version of Cher. Mm -hmm. A bitchy version and like a mean version because Cher is kind. Mm -hmm. I think that like Murray hits it right on the head when he's like, you're literally the kindest person in the house. You're the only reason any of us eat lunch. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. She's caring. She's loving. She has a lot. She has blind spots like with the maid and she doesn't get the difference between being from El Salvador and being from Mexico, um, you know, but you almost want to you almost you it for me, it's almost like, well, I kind of forgive you for that because your world is so small and that's not really your fault right now. Right. And it's, you know, hopefully do better. Hopefully 2023 share understands there's different countries that people can speak Spanish in. (laughs) Yeah, with and I think that that's a big clue into how we all perceive power, too. It's like, oh, I got to move a little bit here. But if I can also kind of bring share down a little bit, maybe I'm here. Mm -hmm. And I think that shift happens. After Ty's almost thrown from the balcony of the mall. Right, right. <laughs> and then she has a story to share. And people love a story. And we love a drama. And we love to be like, oh, my God. And there were gators at the bottom of the mall. Who would have thunk it? Ty could have been eaten by a gator. <laughs> and the complete dismissal of Cher's true real life death experience almost death experience you know that's the part that really adds to the fact that her she's been notched down it's like nobody cares like she literally opens with well well, i mean when i was held at gunpoint and they're like it's too late you didn't you never told us that yeah like it's time we've moved on yeah there's a new shiny Mm -hmm. um and i will say that I remember that scene being a lot of Amber and then the other men in the group. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, well, there it is. The new shiny. So Mm -hmm. they've all gravitated towards it. Yeah. Also, did you notice how one of those guys that was holding her over also looked like they might have been 40? Yeah. I was like, these men do not look age appropriate to be hanging. Talking to to you. Yeah. Like, don't don't talk to strange men at the mall how could that ever work out it's in our favor gonna, it's not gonna work out it's not gonna I, work out 
Another kindness touch point, I think, is the love and understanding that Cher offers to Christian after it dawns on her what's actually happening. Yeah. Like, there's no, like, but I thought you wanted to see me naked. There's none of it. It's just like, oh, this is the new reality. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of tension in this, in this movie without it being unnecessary drama. It's like the yeah. right amount of drama without sort of exacerbating stuff for the sake of a laugh or for a twist and a turn. It's like you're still riveted. You're still trying to fit. You're still into it, but it also doesn't feel overdone. Right. And this time around as a 34 year old woman, I actually clocked the red flags besides the talking like Frank Sinatra (laughs) that would lead Cher to believe that Christian was gay. Mm. And it was like during the club scene and all of it. And then I could, and I was like, Oh my God. And then it's the nineties. It's not, it, it wasn't great being gay in the 90s. Hillary yeah, it's Duff, not like he could come out and say, yeah. Yeah. Hillary Dove had to tell us in like 2003 that gay had to stop being a slur. Um, and so he, so maybe part of him was being all like, well, I'll link myself up with Cher and then other women will leave me alone. And then like, maybe she'll just be into it because she doesn't date high school boys anyways. Right. And then that still kind of backfires in a way because Murray's the one who's like, no, 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 we all know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Cher, you're the only one who doesn't know, or you and Dion are the only ones who don't know. Um, but the fact is, is that even with Murray's helping her understand what is happening, he's still very like, not chill, that's not the right word, but it's still not that big of a deal, right? Like, it's not yeah. the end of the world because Christian is gay. It's like... Yeah, there wait, was no shunning. Yes, <laughs> correct. Right. He's still a part of the group. People still include him. He's still one of the the team, if you will. And it, even that, it's like, it's just refreshing to see... Refreshing? This movie's almost 30 years old. <laughs> I guess it is kind of refreshing in a way because there is so much. Yeah, because there is so much like, you know, trauma porn that comes out when it when it comes to marginalized groups and entertainment. And I'm just so over it. It's like we've had 28 years of trauma porn. I just need fluff and rainbows and everybody in love. By the way, that's how it happens in Heartstopper when it comes out that like the like rugby dude wants to like date the only openly out and gay uh, character in the entire school. And his rugby friends just look at one another one day and they're like, so like he's dating him, right? Yeah. And he'll probably tell us when he's ready. Yeah. And then they drop it. (laughs) Yeah. You know what? And it's interesting how over time or not even over time, it's interesting how in the last 30 years, there's this narrative that's been created where it's like this big and maybe I don't know. I live in California. I don't know. And yes, we did have friends who waited until they left Mm -hmm. to come out. But also a lot of that I feel like coincides with the times because when I was in high school, it was the early 2000s and, you know, people were still using gay as a slur and, you know, a bunch of other horrific things were happening. But I wonder how much, not better, that's not the word. I wonder how much more we could have eased the pain if our entertainment represented in the way that like clueless and heartstopper did it where it's just yeah. like this is a part of who this person is it's a natural part of life end of story you're still here but instead we got we have a lot of tv shows that have this sort of traumatic experience that they're sharing rather mm-hmm. than it being like Hey, like in Simon and the my um the Homo sapien agenda or whatever in the movie, you know, the mom's very much like, uh, there's something different about you. Like, what's up? It's because he's closed off now because he's gay. So like he has a straight personality shift because he doesn't want to tell anybody he's gay. He's scared, even though his parents like opened up the house in the well, his dad kind of says shit where you're just like, dude. But mom made a safe space yeah. and, and you know, you just sort of have these scenarios where it is really just very dramatic and scary and sad and we have less of, hey, this is just a natural part of life. What, what of it? Honestly, I grew up never questioning that my sexuality would be anything but straight because straight was what was expected to me and I, of me and I was very fiercely codependent. And had only gotten the sex talk from sex novels, 
which are also very heteronormative and straight. So, because that's my, the only in orientation that's allowed to exist, which doesn't mm-hmm. make any sense to me. My, so I had an open, I had an out friend in high school. I had one. And then we had a couple of guys that we were suspicious of, but it was very much there was that clear defining line of like, it's real cute when guys are gay and it's real attention seeking when the girls are gay. You know, it's interesting, too, because so I'm rewatching Friends as my like getting ready for bed show. Mm -hmm. Uh, Excuse me. And there is a lot of. What's the word I'm looking for? It's not romanticizing, but it is very clear in this show. The message is very clear. It is absolutely okay if you are a lesbian. The men love it. The men want more of it. And it is totally encouraged, but even between hetero women, for for there to be girl-on-girl stuff. But if you are a gay man, absolutely not. This show is definitely anti-gay man. Because without fail, if not every episode... Every other episode has some sort of homophobic joke in regards to men. Yeah. I can't watch Friends anymore. I was getting confused by the timeline. That's why I was like, I'm going to watch this because there's 10 seasons. I remember watching all of them, but I have some things that I can't place properly. So it's like, let me just do a run through real quick. And honestly, I'm in season. I just... When you watch it all together like Mm -hmm. that and you're just like every other episode, gay joke about men, that's bad, 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 right? Like, you know, all these things, you're just like, okay. Yeah. You guys are syndicated for crying out loud. This is really uncomfortable. And again, I think what we're realizing as we take apart media, but also take apart our existence, but also try to make assumptions based on things that we observe about other people's circumstances is it's always going to be nuanced and different Mm -hmm. so like at my school if you were a girl who was dating girls you only did it for attention Mm -hmm. or you only did it because the men wouldn't date you or whatever and then the and then like the women who ended up graduating and then having grown-up relationships with women when that would come across my feed I'd be like that makes sense yeah if only they could have gone to prom (laughs) yeah And it's, yeah. But then, so that was like the culture of my school. But then the rules of my school, for all school dances, two women could buy tickets together. Because at prom, you have to buy them in pairs. Right. And then sometimes you are buying them in pairs because someone be broke, someone's your date, whatever. So two women could buy a pair of tickets, but two men, no. You know what's interesting? So... I don't know about at your high school, but in my high school, you had to, if you were bringing somebody to prom that didn't go to school, you had to get like a permission slip. They had to submit an ID and all this stuff. Right. Um, so the person that I was supposed to go with and it's a whole thing. So I ended up taking a friend, but they never once like made a stink. I took a friend, I took a girlfriend and they, she had graduated the year before. They never once made a stink about the fact that I wanted to take a girl. It was never questioned. People didn't make gay jokes about us. It was just like, Oh, you know, of course, Julia is doing something that's unconventional. Like that tracks. Um, or maybe if they did make gay jokes, I didn't hear it and I was protected from it. I don't know. Maybe, But like, the point is, is like the school didn't give a shit. Also, at my school, you weren't allowed to go to prom solo. Really? Yeah. No. Like, I don't understand why at Chesterton High School, I'm just going to throw it out there. Yeah. And they can sue me. Call them in. Call them in. I don't understand why at my high school, it was like literally like prom and then marriage. Like, like prom was just your trainer for marriage. (laughs) Because like you had to be coupled up. But, like, lonely women who weren't pretty enough to get dates, they could go together. Like, that's very much how I took it. Yeah. You know, people should be allowed to go to a dance stag if they want to. Like, who I went gives to, a shit? I went to every dance. Every dance stag. Because, like, Cher, I did not date men in high school. Have you seen them? Do you see what they were wearing? I was like, oh, there it is. That's where I got snooty about men's outfits. Because Cher was like, what are they wearing? And I'm like, what are they wearing? 
Yeah, that's nothing, true. Nothing the... that I can get hot over. So I, I did. Went... Sorry, go ahead. I went to every dance stag except for prom. You had pressure to be like, well, and I was like, what if I, and like they somehow knew or were going to ding you if you just paid double for the tickets and just showed up yourself that's so crazy that's wild to me like it's just so wild but again you know that was a completely different state um the other thing too about like dances and proms and what have you like when they're at that frat party bringing it back to clueless and they're all dancing and hanging out or whatever and like i don't know about you guys but we could not get away with buying alcohol Mm -mm. it just wasn't gonna happen I feel like we had it. (laughs) We we had access, but we had access because people had older siblings who didn't give a shit. Um, So when Christian's like, I'm going to go get a, like, can you believe they're charging for brewskis or whatever? Like that to me made me feel like he was so much older. And Mm -hmm. like, also what world do you live in that at a, I guess at a frat party, I've never been to a frat party. I don't know. Yeah, no, I do think that like frats pull dumb shit like that, like paying to get in, paying for a beer wristband or something. They did have the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones playing, so they have to pay for their fee, <laughs> which that's a thing from the 90s movies that I missed and I wish would come back is like, and we talked about this during One Tree Hill where bands just like randomly showed yeah. up and played like in one big party scene where there's some famous band playing. I really miss that. <laughs> A lot. All right. I'm ready to actually ask my question. Okay. Is Josh charming or is he rude? <laughs> I because feel like this question is a trap. <laughs> it is a trap because I even trapped myself in my notes because I'm like, he's so pretentious and he's always dogging on her. I go, but then he's also kind of the voice of the people because he refuses to play into her privilege and makes her witness her own privilege. And now I'm torn. Do we make out with the people who make us feel fragile? I don't know. (laughs) But is he intentionally making her feel fragile? Because like they have such a, and here's the thing where I'm just like, oh, that's a stepbrother, brother situation. They have a sibling relationship. Yeah. Cause they were kids when Mel and his mom were married. Correct. So, so to me, the way that he treats Cher is rooted in that sibling relationship yeah i've never had a boy that i was dating tickle my sides and be like hey nably really filling out there same it has happened in the lunch line by guys i've known for years but never anyone who wanted to date me correct also true yeah all the all them it's yep no no female family members give me shit about my weight it's only the men right and It's just like, I kept looking at it and I was like, and then I'm like, also, am I creeped out that he literally likes Cher because she's probably intellectually easier than the women he is courting in college? Because I didn't like that juxtaposition either. Right. With the gal who is like in the car with him when he picks her up from being robbed. And we kind of already know that he's like, He's not doing great. I wouldn't say that he's struggling at college, but there's got to be a reason he's at Mel's all the time. Well, he said it's because husband number four wants to be a a real family. And by real family, it means like yelling and criticizing him. Right. So he's having a rough go. So maybe he can't also take a, you know, there are, believe it or not, some men who are intimidated when their girlfriends know things (laughs) and it's an immediate turn off. I feel like that's most men because and, I feel right. like the only men who have ever dumped me are the ones who don't like that I'm smarter than them. But all exactly. the ones who stick around, all the ones that I dump, it's because you can't keep up. <laughs> so anyways, so we see that weird juxtaposition where his girlfriend and him are debating. We also hear him say, oh, come on. He was trying to coerce that girl into sex yeah that made me actually pretty uncomfortable yeah I was because like, it, it oh, happens right. like it happens not off screen in the sense of like it's completely off screen we only see their feet 
but still you're just like and then i was like was this is the way 18 year old boys behave yeah i was like was it an all come on because she wasn't putting out or was it an all come on because she was gonna put out but then the phone rang i choose to believe it's the second one (laughs) paul rudd please weigh in and so we see that whole just musician they're having a debate or whatever and then like Cher proves his like pretentious girlfriend ron and he's like (laughs) That's kind of cute because she put his like smart girlfriend into her place. Right. And then and then he's just like digging for gold mines as to why Cher is smart enough to date him. <laughs> for the rest of the movie, he's like, look at her try to give away her skis. <laughs> She's being a social do-gooder. Listen, she had a change. She really did have a change. She did have a change of heart. But also he's like, hey. Man, she highlighted those dates real good. And I'm like, oh, see, so that's the level. That's the level where your comfort level is. Is like you don't really want a girlfriend who is like in acting change or really thinking about things or whatever. You want to be like the guy who gets to go, but babykins, we need to move on from to August there. <laughs> the the surface pretty girl who can rally and and coordinate better than the other girls because she's charming and sweet and innocent and just all the things and if people want to tell me that this isn't relevant it for sure as hell is relevant because we just saw it happen on vanderpump rules (laughs) we've got real life clueless playing out isn't that the truth well, and I think that we see that Cher's charms don't always work because she can't get her way when it comes to her um driver's test and i think and i think you know even though like that she's not successful in that i think that's supposed to like humanize her in a way but i don't think it i don't listen dye my hair blonde and i was Cher in high school and i was like oh Cher's where where i found out that you can get away with anything if you put a little quippy tagline on it and smile real nice yeah no totally i but I, it's interesting that they use the car the dmv the driver right, because license. women can't drive right and, like, I and truly, it could have been anything else really it could have been the debate grade which mm-hmm. was kind of pushed back on right it could have been jim <laughs> it could have been mel actually grounding her and sticking to it there i walked into the movie thinking that i was going to be really disappointed in murray and then every time Murray like said something like, I wasn't calling you woman as a derogative term. We as a people use right. slain. Sometimes that slain is in fact the word woman. I was like, I'm back on team Murray. I love Murray. <laughs> He's actually probably one of my favorites in the movie. Yeah. Yeah. When he's shaving his head with his braces. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, look at Lawrence's head. Cause I'm keeping it real. Cause I'm keeping it real. Murray. What are what how am I gonna explain this to my grandchildren? I know it's so That's it. you want to play games? I'm calling your mother. What? Also, like honestly, I would have married Murray after he was successful of me accidentally getting on the freeway and killing us all. Yeah. <laughs> but I also think that that's why we don't have a freeway in northwest Indiana. We have like 49. It's like what you would call a country highway. Oh and, and I remember just like grasping the wheel like this and finally someone told me driving 49 is like driving any other damn road downtown like you just go a little faster (laughs) and i was like it's the freeway and they're like no it's not the freeway (laughs) that's so funny when i the first time i visited a friend who had moved to pasadena or maybe she was in glendale um this is like 18 years ago she was like we're gonna just go around the corner real quick to go to the bar and i was like cool two maybe three freeways later actual freeways so you know in my podunk town around the corner means literally around the corner like our city blocks still aren't the size of city blocks in san francisco you know so when she when she's like getting on the two and i was like that's a high that's a freeway where she said around the corner like what you can't go around the corner on the freeway. <laughs> I will say that I have only had to take one road trip 
with relying on MapQuest. And it's because my friend had to work and she couldn't leave the same time for her like family's reunion or whatever as her parents because she had to work another shift or Mm. do something. So her mom asked my mom, can Natalie please ride with her? So there is someone who can read the map out loud. And I'm like, I don't know why you think I can read these directions out loud. (laughs) And like, we made it against all odds, but like the sheer anxiety of just like being out on the open road, being like, I don't even know what state we're in. (laughs) Right. Oh my gosh. Natalie, don't worry. Yeah. I would say when you travel, when you visit me, I know how to get everywhere and anywhere within a 90 mile region. (laughs) Well, that's cute. Like, well, and we were going like states away. Like it was a, it was a pretty substantial road trip. I No, I understand. Like every other state, every other part of the country, you drive six hours and you're in a different state. I drive six hours. I'm still in California. Well, and and then like. In either direction, north or south. I'm still in California driving six hours. I had to print out MapQuest to get to Stephanie's dad's house one time and never made it, I'm pretty sure. And he lived like 10. It's because he lived on some like weird neighborhood in the dunes that like had cliffs and like beers and like, and then you have no signal on your little block phone, on your calculator phone. I was like, I think I'm just going home. <laughs> I think we're done here. I've tried. I made an I, effort for today. I tried my best. It's dark. I can't see shit in the dark. I couldn't even see my own father's house in the dark this past weekend, as you know, because I told you I was like, every light's off in this house. I couldn't see the number. I couldn't see one distinguishing feature. Which just that blows my mind. People in this neighborhood do that. So when I lived in downtown, it was like everybody had their porch light on because there was a park down the street and people would leave the park when the parks quote closed. And then Mm -hmm. if your porch was dark, it was an invitation for someone to just curl on up and stay warm. So people left their porch lights on. So moving into this neighborhood, it's like, I'll come home at midnight. And I'm just like, why is everything dark? And our street lights are attached to people's houses. So like if the person where the street light is, doesn't want to pay for it on their electric bill, Mm -hmm the city the the electric company just turns it off i i will say that it is ridiculous how comfortable money makes people because i'm sitting here like i leave one light on this house all day on Mm -hmm. if i leave if i go to trivia one light stays on it'll rotate what light it is but do you think i'm gonna walk through this fucking house at 11 o'clock at night and not assume that a ghost, a demon, or a white man is trying to get me. Listen, I don't like walking into a dark room. You know this. <laughs> like, I always know when someone has been visiting my house that doesn't that doesn't care about the dark. Every, mm-hmm. every room that is an open room has a light on in my house. I do not like walking by a dark room. When I have to go to the bathroom at night, there is a, like, a nightlight in my bathroom, but it's Of course, right next to the mirror. And I'm like, you can't look at the mirrors because it's a portal. But you don't want to turn on all of the lights to dismiss the portal because because now you'd get all disoriented and you'll never go back to sleep. So it's just me walking into the bathroom like this, like not making eye contact with myself in the mirror. Because I'm like, no, that's how the demons get you. (laughs) Even when I have people over, I'll turn the hall light on so that way they can like navigate and find the bathroom. My sister can't sleep in a room where a chair is a chair or a mirror is within sight of the bed. Oh, interesting. She's convinced that a ghost will sit in that chair just to taunt her. (laughs) Interesting. Okay. Hmm. We got super. We got we got weird anxieties in my family about the dark. (laughs) Hey, I I. People, my my dad's always like, oh, you're paying the electric bill with all these lights on. Yeah, and I am. So you can judge me later. Not going to catch a white man jumping out at me in the dark. Uh Uh-uh. I saw Uh -uh. Barbarian. Sometimes they are living in your walls. (laughs) Every once in a while, Penelope will, like, really be interested in the attic that's entrance that's in my walk-in closet. I've never been in my attic. Someone could be living up there. I would never know. (laughs) 
You know what? My friend tried to get me to watch this YouTube series where people had people living in their houses and didn't know. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh like actual humans and i was like absolutely not am i watching that i'm not watching that like why on earth do you think that that is a thing i would enjoy and then in the group chat the two of them would start talking about it and i was like all right just let me know when you're fucking done because i'm, I'm like, cool like, if someone is living in my attic i would rather just not know yeah honestly i would rather just live in the mystery as to why i thought there were more cookies yet there are less cookies <laughs> amen Agreed. But yeah, I, but, and so my family and I have a lot of superstitions about the dark, but I think it's because we're blind as fuck in the dark. I Should I be driving at night? Who's really to say? But we are blind as fuck. Oh my gosh. Um. Okay. Let's, let's go. Let's go back to the, let's go back to the, let's go back to shares bad driving being a okay. trope that they could have used something else to do to, humanize her in a way that's really it honestly that is just a bad trope and that's all a she bad wrote. Trope. yeah i i kind of understand it because we have already kind of been under suspicion that she is a bad driver oh that's how they open um the introduction to her in that montage Correct. yes she is a oops sorry yeah <laughs> my <laughs> bad she is a bad driver why do anybody say my bad anymore? I believe it should. I think I do. I think I'm like, oh, my bad, my bad. Um, maybe because the codependency has been beaten out of me because of therapy. Maybe that's why we've stopped apologizing in cute ways from the 90s. I like that theory. Um, you know, it made sense thematically as to why she would be a bad driver I bet you she got in that car and just assumed that she would be a bad driver or a good driver. Why is Murray never, or not Murray, why is Mel never in that fucking car with her? Well, how is Mel, this powerful big time attorney, just like, yeah, man, you can have a car without a license. Right. Like, And then he's like, Cher, get in here. What is this? This is a second notice, blah, blah, blah. I don't remember getting a first notice. The ticket is the first notice. Like, how do you not help your daughter like how do you put your daughter in a position where that's a thing as you know when my dad was teaching me how to drive he allowed me to drive into a ditch he allowed me to turn too wide into a ditch and he insisted that that was a learning experience so like i don't understand why men just make up hardships and then be like it's a learning experience honestly because you know what you're the one who has to pay for it, sir, because right. you don't have a job. Also, we don't have to craft learning experiences. They will just come. <laughs> they will just happen naturally we don't, we don't on have to their orchestrate own. Learning experiences. Correct. I just uh, anyway. So I would say that something, and then you know, some of the language is a little dated too. But that's you know, a byproduct was, of the '90s, right? It, like. I honestly thought that this was one of the better older movies that we've watched where I made it very far into the movie before the R word was used. Correct. And then I was like, that's the only thing I'm going to have to say. Right. <laughs> right. And it's used, I think, twice. There's two. Di- oh, there's- I only heard it the one time. Well, because they use the with the actual R and then they use it later, a slang version of it. Oh, and I remember thinking, okay, so all right, okay, those are those are you know whatever you don't that happened. Also, it's the '90s, and that was. There are still people to this day that I know that use it, and I have to ask them politely to stop. I was dating a man, and I was drunk and new in my relationship, and he just threw it out in the middle of a game night. And before I could even process what had happened in my own home, my friend started to ream him. And I remember just like thanking her later. I was like, I couldn't even process that I was linked to a person who still uses that word. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually really surprising when it does come out, when you've known somebody for a while and you've thought you've been in every type of conversation scenario where it could surface and it doesn't, and you think you're in the clear and then it shows up. 
I've been told that they're just allowed to say it in the military, and that's why it slips out. And I'm like, oh, cute. <clears throat> you have to understand, I live in the military culture. So when I'm away at training or whatever, that's all it is. I go, yep, that's all it is. Uh, slurs and homophobic slurs yeah. and racism. Good for you for wanting to be in that kind of friendship group. Honestly. My God. You <laughs> I'm so sick of that, too. Like, well, all the boys around me get to use it. <laughs> I gotta be cool. But do you, though? Yeah, that's hard. I can't. I can't with that shit. And there's a lack of accountability there, yeah, which is really that's, frustrating. That's why I'm convinced that men only truly love other men. Because they're always posturing for one another. <laughs> And then they're just like being their most awful selves around us. And meanwhile, women are having honest and open conversations with one yeah. another. Yeah. Well, and then the men who are trying to have honest and open conversations and really do make a change so that way they're not contributing are getting treated like shit for it. Yeah. Not just by men. There are some women who make them feel this way too, which is really frustrating. So I appreciate the women who knee jerk reaction go, I got to check myself because why do I think that way? Um, because as a reminder, everybody, the patriarchy is bad for us all. It's bad for everybody, as Annie Sieg will like to tell you on every episode of Tell the Men I've Tolerated Before she's ever guested on. Yeah. Patriarchy is bad for you. It's bad for me. Bad for we. <laughs> it's bad for you. It's bad for me. It's bad for we. That should be a shirt. It should be. <laughs> I, uh, I support that. And that's why I think one of the reasons why I like Murray so much, because when they do sort of... he. He sort he has this way of being a part of his culture, but then also understands like there's this point where you can't this line that you can't cross. Mm -hmm. And with that couple, Dion and, and Murray, even though they fight like crazy and that kind of drives me crazy, and I also kind of hate that kind of that trope shit. There's a lot of tropes I hate, which is like 90% of them. <laughs> um I do love that he has these moments where he is tender with Dion. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate that because, again, it's so not very often that we see, one, men being tender with their women and, two, black men being allowed to be tender. No. I love Murray. And I love Sean. And I'm kind of bummed that he's not in the movie more. I was like, there's my bro, Sean. Where have you been, Sean? I think his name is Lawrence in the movie, but Sean on the TV show. Oh, maybe I just have it wrong. I don't know. I mean, but it's possible that they changed his name for the TV of show. Of course. It's, everything is possible. Can we talk about how Josh and Cher kiss for the first time because Josh has to reassure her that she is, in fact, smart and valid after, like, some gross lawyer has like his dick all his tied up in knots down. and has mm -hmm. to go and cry <laughs> in his car on the way home. And then the implic okay, yes, we can. But then also when they do kiss and she's like, Well, you know what happened next? And then it cuts to a wedding and a she's wedding. like, No. And I'm like, Oh, you're implying that you guys had sex, which also makes me slightly uncomfortable because he yes, he's a freshman in high school and you're six freshman and college or yeah freshman yeah. in college and you're 16 so what like a junior it's yeah. still it's still he's still 18 you know i get weird about the college thing i was like i don't know i feel like college people should only be dating college people yeah it's weird it's to say my girlfriend's in high school and also my former ex but, my former st sister but then i also get weirded out when like seniors in college are dating freshmen in yeah. college as we saw in tell me lies yeah because I'm like, she's fresh off the farm. Yeah. Get away from her. You're about to get a 401k. <laughs> You're about to get a 401k. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because it's just, there's so much growing that happens between the ages of like 13 to 25. Mm -hmm. And even just, even between the ages of like 17 and 22, there's so much growing that happens. And it just feels... I don't know. Maybe we I don't should know stop how dating in our 20s. <laughs> Maybe we should just stop because I can't be comfortable with any age bracket. I know. It just makes me feel very strange. Yeah. I, for one thing, and I can only name one other film, but I was like, why was there so many like movies 
where like the message was you can date your step siblings because it was like this one and drive me crazy the fosters had a, had a b plot i have a friend who married his stepsister not an ex stepsister actual stepsister it's weird it and i mean that your family pretty... is emotionally unavailable <laughs> and i'm pretty sure the parents are still married and I'm pretty sure he's still married to this woman. And they have children. I know they have children. Yes. I know they're married and have children. I'm confident. I know that I'm confident they have children. I'm half confident they're still married. I think they happened met. on step by step too. Did it happen on step by step? <laughs> I don't know. I feel like something weird happened. Remember on Seventh Heaven when actual siblings kissed for funsies? I blocked a lot of that show out because it contributed to the religious propaganda that I was raised in. I got on Seventh Heaven TikTok the best. Oh my gosh. Because the guy that does the movie comparisons that we like, yeah. it's him watching Seventh Heaven. Oh, I'm going to have to go find those because he is a delight. Oh, um, but yeah, just like, oh, well, you know, on The Real Housewives of Salt Lake City, there's a woman who's married to her step-grandfather because her grandmother knew she was dying, and she was like, one of the girls will marry you and take care of you. See, It was like is, a legacy. <laughs> this, is, this is what is wrong with our culture and our society because it was really, really common over 100 years ago for that sort of thing to happen because when my great-grandmother died in childbirth, they just went back to the homeland and sent over the sister to marry yes, and continue having sister. children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that still happens where it's like all of a sudden, like, my spouse has been killed in a wretched car accident. And I'm like, you know who has money? His brother. <laughs> One Tree Hill. One Tree Hill. It happens on One Tree Hill. It happens on One Tree Hill. It happened as recent as 2008. And it's like, Karen, you don't even like the Scott parents. Like, it's not like you have some, like, really great relationship with Grandma and Grandpa Scott. Like, Honestly. What, what is beholding you to this family? <laughs> I don't know. Is Keith's dick that good? Like, it I don't can't understand. Be. I, I believe that Craig Schaefer's dick is probably, like, very confident. <laughs> Fair. Something about the way he wears a pair of jeans. I'm like, I bet you Craig Schaefer can lay it down. I bet you and make he it can't worth it. Be comfortable in skinny jeans. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I'm like, I bet you he can make the the leg shave worth it, worth my while. And honestly, has any other man? Probably not. <laughs> I just cousin brother. Cousin brother, man cousin brother or actually you told me it's a girl so cousin sister yeah i just the cousin brother still works in the opposite direction because yeah. of lucas right it's just one of those things where it's like do you guys not know other people there are other people <laughs> okay so i don't know about your hometown but the town in which i live is also my hometown and this is a touch point that makes me uncomfortable I for like I gave up on dating because I could not find a guy in town who didn't know my child's father or have like some sort of a relationship with him, whether it was a friendship or they knew each other because of the music scene or what have you. And it was it got to the point where it's just like, I can't date anybody in this town. Y'all know each other. Yeah. This is horrifying. Horrifying. I don't know what to tell you about that except for to move. I'm trying, girl. That <laughs> student loan debt is real. It just makes move. it real hard. Biden, Biden put out a spammy article on Google today that he might be getting that taken care of. I hope so because then at least – then then my debt to income ratio would at least be equal. <laughs> right now my student loan debt is more than I make in a year. So I, I can't really do shit with that. Truly hate it here. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. You know, my sister wasn't wrong when she said that Clueless still holds up. I was just going to ask you, what's our comfort level? Here we go. And then actually, no, what I was going to specifically ask was, does Clueless get a pass for the outdated language because of its messages of female empowerment? I think it mostly gets a pass because of it being the 90s. I am one of those people who is like, you can't be mad at Clueless for writing dialogue for how all of us asshats talked back then. Like, I said the word. 
did you not say the word we, like <laughs> i so and here's the thing like if i said it in front of my parents we were reprimanded so it was like a contraband word that would be used in like school but you still managed to say it a time or two yeah i probably also used the slur that hillary duff had to tell me in 2005 was not cool <laughs> like well, and it's like it's like the term um L A M E when people want to reference something and they want to oh, say it's L. That's right. It's, I it's kind of the that same that one's a slur. <laughs> it's kind of the same thing, right? Like now, like twenty years ago, gosh, there are still people who do uh say it now, use it now. Uh-huh. Um and it's just that process of learning. Yeah. Some of us are still too dumb to know what some of the words that we say mean. <laughs> well, and to expand bigger than that, like, so I'm having this awakening right now, which I've shared with you off- offline when we have conversations. There is so much about the world and myself I don't know because I've never yeah. had the opportunity to figure that out. Like, I just wrapped this class and in that class I learned, like, holy shit, like, there's a whole knowledge gap here and Mm -hmm. not because of a skill set or anything like that but because of like I've never left my hometown so like the knowledge gap is because I've never left my hometown so there's still a lot of things I need to learn in that regard and so sometimes I feel like that's kind of similar like the community in which I live is very still red and that's hard because I have to actively work against my own what I'm being exposed to to locally because if i don't seek out other information i could easily become Mm -hmm. that well for me what and i've already spent enough time doing self-hate so we're not here for that shit (laughs) and for me what it gets down to is like the evolution and the ebbs and flows that is language it's very hard being a person who's been able to read as long as i've been able to read at high levels when people want to treat language like it's so static right and it's not it's it's evolving all the time and it's like how many people still call tissues kleenex and eventually the like the words just mingled Mm -hmm. and then like how many people have used the word that you spelled and have only known it in that like boring and dumb connotation right because we don't use that word anymore in the medical language we do about horses right well and two you know there's just so like the insights that covid brought with with job descriptions you know i would read job descriptions and it's like well you must lift 25 pounds and that made no sense to me because it's like it's literally a job that doesn't require lifting why would you list that and then you know covid hits and everyone can work from home and here comes um disability advocates calling in calling out how that's a discriminatory act and i thought it didn't occur to me it didn't click it didn't click. Like I understood it was weird that you would ask for that, but I didn't understand why, because I am well, not a part of that community to be negatively impacted in that way from that language. Well, it, it's like my therapist is always trying to teach me, like you have to go through every day believing that everything is okay until someone tells you that it's not okay. You had to catch me on emojis. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah. Because some people believe that emojis represent them and some dumbasses are just like, it's a picture. (laughs) I put a picture on my phone. (laughs) Yeah. I will say, though, you know, part of the reason why I felt like it was okay to let you know, one was because I know that you're actively trying, you're actively doing the work. You know, you're not somebody who's going to give me shit when I call, when I, it was a calling in, not a calling out situation. I was so, I was, I was just like looking at my phone and being like, God damn it. And part of me wanted to blame AI. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, this is because AI is starting to represent us. Yeah. Yeah. Truly. So now you have to think about that to be mm-hmm. like, am I accidentally misrepresenting myself? Because now we've gone back to hieroglyphics to express ourselves. I think about that all the time. And not just with the hieroglyphics and the emojis and what have you, just in general with like, because there's so much identity politics that, you know, go on. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's not black and white. 
it's yeah. not that simple. You know, I'm a mixed race woman and I'm a single mother and my I was raised by a black cop. And so there's all these little things that have contributed to me. But if you take one of those like um, descriptors and only look at that one descriptor, you can make an assumption about me that's completely unfair. Yeah. Try being a woman in her 30s who went, well, maybe I am queer and I've never known it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a real thing. It's a real thing. And then having to talk around your family, not even like having a huge coming out situation with them, but just like having conversations where you go, yeah. And that's why it's always cool being like sitting at the queer cousin table and like your family just having to like readjust because they're like i guess that's how natalie identifies now mm -hmm. and how are we going to tell her any different even though i know she's only been accosted by penises <laughs> like i'm trying to block it because you never know what if you say it three times and it happens and it like shows it appears. oh my gosh that's a that's a scary thing <laughs> but it but it is and i think you know for me clueless gets this pass for outdated language because one it's 1995 two there's so many other things that are valuable about the movie that are timeless and we can learn a lot from mm -hmm. yes the only time i'm not going to give a movie a pass for using the outdated language is when they are using the outdated language to be fucking hurtful correct so like Welcome to the dollhouse loves to use that fucking R word like an insult. Yeah. <laughs> and like a derogatory insult and they know it. And then she has a reality check because then like the little boy who she called it had a brother or someone. Someone was at his house who was clearly like in some sort of state mentally uh, developing and... <laughs> And then she had to be like, oh, that's why it's not cool. And I'm like, there you go. You had to learn it in the 90s. Some men are still learning it today. <laughs> yeah, truly. Or just like like other things. Like I used to always get really uncomfortable when my white friends would be like, oh, well, it's going to be this summer, Julie. I'll be darker than you. So like how black can you really be? And I understood that to be hurtful because it was hurtful. And I, but I didn't have the language to explain like why that shit's not okay to say. And then I want to say like three or four years ago, the internet just uh, like came for that phrase. And like yeah. all of these advocates broke it down on why it wasn't okay. And I was like, thank you. Because internally it hurt, hurts my feelings. And I don't understand how to explain why. Because if that's the space they're saying it, like if that's where they're coming from and the space they're saying it, they might not even be able to receive my ill structured thoughts on why I'm in, you know, my feelings yeah. are hurt. And then now I have the language to say it because it's fucked up. You shouldn't yeah. say stuff like that to people. But it was a common thing people said to me for 35 years. Yeah, because people be dumb. People be dumb. Our family, our, the older people in our family used to uh, refer to us kids as like little Native Americans, but not the Native American word because of how dark we get in the summer. Oh to be gosh. fair, my great uncle really wanted to be convinced that because one of our ancestors fucked around with Billy the Kid while he was fucking around with the Native Americans, <laughs> that we were somehow linked to a, a tribe. And we had, I'm like, hey, senile man. Like, even as a kid, I was like, that's not how that worked. But yeah. Then 20 to 30 years later, here's poor Elizabeth Warren, who also believed her family's folklore, and it ended up being fucking false. So sometimes well, your family lies to you, is what I'm saying. Well, and oh, I did tell you the story. There was a point in history in Oklahoma where you could grease the palm of the census taker for the tribes and be added to the list. And you could pay like $5 to be added to the list back when they were like, you know, after the Trail of Tears and like they were establishing the tribes and figuring out how to give them support because, you know, genocide. So I have all these white people in this region because Oklahoma, you come in with the Dust Bowl in the 30s. So we got a lot of yeah. people from the the um, 
the Dust Bowl. And so they're, oh, yeah, I'm part Native American, da, da, da. And then they start doing their DNA tests, and there is none. Zero yeah. zip zilch. So a friend of mine did extend, did went digging. She's like, where did this story come from then if it, there's not even in my DNA? And she finds out you could pay, you could bribe the census taker, the white census taker to add you to the list for five fucking dollars. Because yeah. an so, 18, whatever, that's a lot of money. Yeah. Uh-huh. So sometimes your relative is in a real tough spot and then just makes up a lie. <laughs> so I'm over here like all you white people who say you're Cherokee, I need you all to get a DNA test. Okay? Get a DNA test. Because I know. I don't believe you. Now you're just telling me you have a shady ancestor who wanted to cheat the system and also further harm the Native community. My my great grandma had to lie about being Polish so we were safe from Russia or something. <laughs> You know, you know, it's just wild. It's, it's just, just wild. wild. And that's why everyone, we have to remember the nuance held within Clueless and truly all of the media that we take in. Unless, of course, it is the time traveler's wife. And other things that are just horrific with the tropes and the bad narratives. And consider who's telling the story. Right. That's, that's the other yeah. part of this lesson is consider who's telling the story. I don't want anyone to be mean to Brendan Fraser because he won last night. I want everyone to continue to applause him because I don't think he deserves to be bullied ever again. But part of me is like, oh, I feel like that movie is more problematic than beautiful like you thought, Brendan. Yeah. Yep. And part of me wants to watch it. But then we're adding into but it. But then we're adding into it. That's the <laughs> like if I had watched it when it first came out, that's one thing. But now we know that's something See, else and that's the sneaky thing because in the 90s we grew up where you could get something from blockbuster and no one had a paper trail correct and now if i stream it it means i supported it correct it's just it's life's hard man i miss 1995 so much um on that note natalie tell me are you still comfy with the clueless 100 percent. i think i'm a little less comfy with like my my fever dream that it was Josh that made me fall in love with Paul Rudd. I honestly think it was role models. <laughs> oh, I loved him in Romeo and Juliet. Oh, yeah. When he was Paris, the little bitch boy. Yeah. <laughs> I just thought he was so cute. Also would have left him for Romeo as well. Honestly. Though. However, I feel like Paul Rudd did great in that role. <laughs> All the men in Romeo and Juliet, like, could literally not get the time of day from me. <laughs> All Romeo, Mr. Cabulet, Mr. Montague, <laughs> Paris, Mercutio, Benvolio, Benvolio. No, no, thank you to any and all of them. Honestly, that's probably true for all of Shakespeare's men. Well, that is Shakespeare. Um, but yeah, fuck it. I'm still good with Clueless. We had a great conversation about it. We should be talking more about like. Has anyone else seen Suck and Blow at a party that was not that party at Clueless? I literally, the parties in Clueless had me convinced that would be my party life in high school. Yeah. That you would just be sucking and blowing. And like hanging out and like big, big music yeah. and dancing and like group time. Like, n I mean, I all the parties I went to in high school, <laughs> people were sitting on the couch drinking. <laughs> Yeah. Lame. <gasps> I just said it. I just said it. And you spelled it too. And my dumb ass brain was like, she spelled it. So say it. Oh my God. You have to deprogram. You're I have to deprogram. I have to grow. Yeah. I have to stop. I have to stop leaning on being a child that was raised in the 90s. It's hard. I remember the first time you explained that to me, too. And I was like, what do you mean? Is, like, PETA mad about the horses? Like, because that's the only connotation I have for it. Right. <laughs> Is that, like, that's what happened to horses. <laughs> and then I didn't realize, again, there's a great uh, series on TikTok where she just holds an index card up to people and is like, are you comfortable with saying this out loud? <laughs> and then when they say it... <laughs> And then she goes, oh, and then she gives you a horrible background 
on a word yeah. that we thought was a normal word and it's called are my coworkers canceled <laughs> yeah it's getting yeah the cancel the coworker that series is so much fun it's so funny and i'm still learning things we all are God. we all are are you still comfortable with clueless I am. I watch it every year. I watch it multiple times a year. I really need to expand what I watch, though, because, again, I'm realizing that I'm reverting to comfort things mostly because I can't handle the horrors and the reality of the real world or my life and situation. <laughs> uh, um, but, yeah, I am. I probably won't stop watching it. Yeah. And I will say this, too. I think... I think when we pick apart things too much, we forget that, like, movies aren't always supposed to be just, like, a shiny gift handed to you in a bow. Like, one day we will cover Drop Dead Gorgeous, and I will have to explain to people that that movie is still funny because it's fucking satire. Yeah, and I think it's hard for people to register what satire is yeah. because whenever people say things like blazing saddles would never be made today. And I'm like, it's, it's satire. satire. Like you don't have to think it's funny. You don't have to agree with it. But the thing is, is it's satire. They're not being, they know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And, and so, you know, I'm not, I'm not a studier of comedy in the way that other people are, but like, when we watched it, because I, I said to my kid, I was like, you know what? We should watch this because this keeps coming up all the time. It's driving me crazy. Like, I don't remember. What do I remember from this movie? So we watched it. And I was like, this is completely satire. You could potentially get away with making a satirical film in this nature today. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And um, it just, it really, it was like, what, what, how are we losing how have we gotten away from the point where like comedy is no longer comedy and just like well, fart jokes all the time? You know what I mean? And then we've like sanitized comedy to the point where like the only people who are like raging about their rights to be funny are like Chappelle and Chris Rock. And it's like, no, that's not what we meant. That wasn't in satire and it wasn't smart and it wasn't witty. You're shitty. Yeah, I actually, somebody, um, did I tell you this? Somebody was like, oh, can, you should check out Chris Rock's um, latest special. He, like, goes after everybody. And so I turned it on, and I'm like, I'm not laughing. Like, right. none of this is funny. You're and just having a, a stand on a street corner. You're ha And, okay, granted, Chris Rock is, <laughs> you know, wealthier than I am and, like, has money. And he's got, you know, he's in Adam Sandler's pocket. But, like... None of this is funny. I just did a writing, a comedy writing class, and the people in that class wrote funnier shit than what I saw in that special. Yeah. So there's a difference between just like roasting people because you have hate in your heart and you have unhealed wounds and what Blazing Saddles was doing. And speaking of the, ro like, I told you I watched the Pamela Anderson roast to prepare for our book club, and yeah. it wasn't funny. It no. was a lot of, like, below-the-belt jokes, you know, just things that it's like, this isn't funny. And there are some comedians where their shit just, like, Richard Pryor, I have yet to run into anything he's done that, and maybe somebody needs to send me something. I don't know. But all the shit I watch from Richard Pryor is still fucking funny to this day. Yeah. I don't remember, well, Robin Williams did a lot of accents, so let me cool my jets before I'm like, Robin Williams wasn't offensive. He did say that French people let babies smoke cigarettes. <laughs> it was a funny bit, and it was satire, and there's a difference. <laughs> there's yeah, a difference. It's just, because it's so Blazing Saddles and Drop Dead Gorgeous are turning a mirror onto a problem. Right. And just being like, well, maybe if you laugh at this, you'll stop doing it. <laughs> right. It's like, it's kind of like our favorite guy on TikTok who's watching things. And he's kind of like, it's that, it, that's what he's doing. Mm -hmm. He's turning the mirror around. Um, I will say I do want to study comedy more now that mm -hmm. I've taken this class. Because there's one thing. It's one thing to be funny in conversation. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to write funny narrative. It's another to be writing like monologue jokes or sketches. Yeah. And I'm curious to, you know, get into that more. And I actually learned a lot because 
one of the things that I wrote didn't land well and not yeah. in that because it just, it wasn't funny, but because I didn't do a good job at explaining in the direction mm -hmm. of why it was written that way. And so there's a lot of like, yeah, there's, there's a, lot a lot of lot stuff of in there. Yeah. Comedy. Yeah, there really is. And there's a lot of like, it's just, it's so much more, it's not complicated. It's just, it's one of those things where like, you can't really just dive in and Mrs. Maisel it. Like that's yeah. a rare thing. No. Um, I think that's what I wrote on my, like, when he asked, like, what do you want to learn? And I was like, I know that I'm funny and I know that I have bits. I don't know how to put them to paper in a structure that makes sense. Oh, you'll learn that. Right. Because, yeah. and I told him, I was like, I'm convinced that there's a logical like outline to comedy that I've just never been taught and therefore I cannot do comedy. But I'm already doing comedy. Yeah, he he will yeah. totally help you harness that. And for me, it was like, oh, a lot of this is very much how we write plays. Mm -hmm. Um, And I understand that because I've written several plays that have been staged, It, but they've all been dramatic. So the doing the setup punchline stuff was like crafting that was harder for me. Because I'm so used to, here's a very sad, dramatic moment. Now make this character say something funny to release the pressure and yeah. then move on back to being drama. Um, so that's why now that I've taken the class, I'm like, fuck, I really want to get more into this and like the structure behind it and the study behind it because it's so fascinating. It's it's not that it's so different. Like all the techniques are the same when you do dramatic writing in the sense of like the structure and like how you organize things. It's just... It's, it's just a little it's just a little different and it's that little difference that if you practice it every day will make you really really good so that's where i'm at in life now <laughs> well guys that's where we're at at life jules what's coming up on your show <laughs> yeah we should probably wrap this huh um this week we don't have anything new what we have last week was we dropped the teaser for white lotus for our patreon bonus folks featuring mario mello from movies with mr mario so if you are a white lotus fan um join and you are not yet a member on Patreon, you can join for the low, low price of pay what you want, a dollar or the higher tier. I will tell you, if you join Jelly Pops book, um, the Jelly Pops best friend tier this month, because March is my birthday month, you will receive a very fun and free gift. We love a swag. This offer is only good until March 31st, 2023. So get on, so get on. So don't email us that anymore future people in 2025 because who was it some comedian said that she would supply everyone in her audience or something a vibrator she still be buying vibrators for oh people. my gosh yeah this offer is only good until march 31st 2023 um you're still welcome to join the jelly pops best friend tier after that but only in this month will you receive a free gift Secondly, we are our book club is meeting on Sunday. So if you are a lover of books and reading and you want a really fun community of people to be a part of, we read book to screen adaptations only in this book club. This month we are reading Daisy Jones and the Six. Last plug, last two plugs. Uh, last Friday, we dropped a bonus episode that was ad free, which is not a thing that happens um, unless you are a Patreon member for Whitley Gilbert. We talked about Whitley Gilbert from a different world with guest Ivana Robinson, and it was a lot of fun. I am convinced that Whitley Gilbert ended up on Step by Step at some point. Oh, I'll have to look into that for you. And the last thing I will plug in two weeks, Natalie and I will be visiting Madison Avenue <laughs> on the pop culture makes me jealous instagram handle to talk about season five of mad men oh my god i didn't know what you were talking about i was like are we going on a trip <laughs> like what i didn't buy a ticket to something um hi everyone i'm natalie katona chaotic and uninformed and <laughs> On my show, To All the Men, I've tolerated before that drops episodes every Thursday or Tuesday if you're a Patreon member. We are covering this week Annie Sieg, we mentioned her earlier, and gatekeeping within the art community. Last week, we covered how negging isn't cute, nor is it flirting with Nat New um, of D&D TikTok acclaim. And on our Patreon, 
things happen, but not recently because my family got a new baby. Not me. <laughs> my family. So things happen. Yeah. Join and it. Join it. And next Monday we will be we will be back on Natalie's channel discussing how to lose a guy in 10 days. And I will have a song. Well, wait. I can't sing the You're So Vain song if I'm the one reading the recap. Do you want me to sing it for you? Yeah. I'll do that for you. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be fun. Yeah. So, friends, thank you for tuning in. This has been a great time. Natalie, why don't you close us out? And we'll see you next week at that fancy party that Kate Hudson's at at the end of the movie. Stay cozy. Stay comfy. <laughs> And goodbye. No, it's still alive. Are we?